Hello, friends, and welcome to our 16th episode of Listener Submitted Stories. This series continues to be amazing, and with the continued popularity, we love hearing all the weird experiences our listeners have encountered. As always, the following stories are unedited and can be very frightening. These are told in the way that they were sent in, usually written by the person that experienced the encounter. We ask that you please respect those who have shared their stories with us, and also respect everyone in the comment section while discussing these stories. Some of these stories have never been shared, even among family and friends. Bill and myself both feel it's important to provide an outlet for others to share their bizarre, strange encounters without fear of judgment or ridicule, and we're happy to continue providing this platform. Now, sit back, relax, and let's begin. The Walking Pole Hi Steve, here's my story about what happened to me, my brother, and partner at the time. It was summer of 1981, around 5 a.m. and light outside. This happened in Port Talbot, South Wales, UK. We were in our lounge chatting and we looked out the window where there's a mountain with a white road going around the side of it. Suddenly, we saw a 30-foot walking pole. It was walking up the side of the white road and it had nothing holding it up. We could see the bottom of it. We watched it for about five minutes. It seemed to have a purpose sort of striding up the side of the mountain. We were gobsmacked. My brother and I still both talk about it sometimes. We called it the postman. We were 15 at the time. Thank you for inviting me to share with you. Much appreciated. Love, Lisa. Yowie Encounters Hello, Steve and Bill. We love listening to your National Park Mysteries, so thought we would send in one of our encounters. We have attached some photos to show you the location and the vegetation in the area to give you a feel for where we were. Over the years, my wife Claire and I have watched programs and read articles on Bigfoot and other cryptids, but never thought we would one day have a close encounter of our own. Australia has its own version of Bigfoot, known as the Yowie, or Hairy Man. It's shorter and stockier than Bigfoot, and witnesses say that its head sits bang right on its shoulders giving the impression that it doesn't have any neck at all. It also has a flattened nose and a reputation for being quite aggressive. Our first encounter was brief. In early 2010, we stayed at the Clear Mountain Lodge on Clear Mountain, about 25 miles northwest of Brisbane. The hotel is located right on top of the mountain, which is sparsely populated and covered in thick bushland. A bit further to the west is the massive Diagular State Forest, which stretches further inland and both to the north and to the south. Claire and I both loved getting out of the city together, especially away into the country, to the peace and tranquility of nature. It was not so far from the city where we lived, but far enough away to enjoy being alone for some much-needed us time. During the night, it rained heavily, and the next morning after breakfast in the restaurant, we went out for a stroll around the decking. There was no one else in sight, and we considered ourselves fortunate to be the only ones outside enjoying the morning sunshine together. We gazed in wonder at the panoramic views, bathed in the glorious, soft golden light of the fresh, clear morning. The wide brown decking was elevated high off the ground, and it wrapped around the front and side of the hotel. It was framed by a clear glass barrier, and around the side of the building, the decking ran past the kitchens and then ramped downwards to ground level. At the bottom was the car park to the right and dense bushland to the left. When we ambled around to the side of the building, I noticed strange muddy marks along one side of the ramp that ran from the bottom right up to where the kitchens were at the top, and then they just stopped. That's odd, I thought to myself as I dropped Claire's hand to have a closer look at them. Then I realized they looked like giant footprints. I stared in disbelief. I motioned Claire over and asked what she thought they were. She just gave me that perplexed look of, what the? We both started to shake our heads in disbelief, for each mark clearly had the shape of a huge footprint, with one large big toe next to a row of smaller toes. Someone, or something, had walked along there with bare, muddy feet early in the morning. I'm six feet tall and solidly built and I put my foot next to the one, and it was clearly double the size of my foot. Claire and I stared at each other in amazement. We were both clearly wondering who or what would walk around in bare feet in the rain and mud, 
and someone so big? Suddenly, it dawned on me. It must be a yaoi. We both took a sharp breath inward and uttered an expletive. We followed the muddy marks down to the bottom of the ramp, and every one looked the same. One giant footprint after another. It confirmed we weren't imagining the first one. Clearly, something bipedal had walked from out of the dense bushland, up the ramp, to the windows at the kitchens at the top. It looked like it had been standing outside the window and shuffling around for a while, as there were lots of footprints close together and overlapping. It was eerie to note that the footprints didn't go anywhere, though. They just seemed to stop. When we got home, we researched Yowie sightings and discovered that there had been a lot of them in and around that area, which just added to its credibility. Claire and I also love the hinterland area of the Gold Coast and the national parks in that area. The Springbrook National Park is the first of a string of huge national parks that stretch over 100 miles inland and over 800 miles to the south. Around Springbrook, and far to the west into the Lamington National Park, the terrain is often steep and rugged, with deep gorges and dense bushland, much of it more like rainforest with thick tropical undergrowth. We love to go and have overnight stays in different places, and one weekend we stayed at a place called the Lyrebird Retreat. It was set on private land with four cabins scattered amongst the thick bracken and lush ferny rainforest. The cabins were all erected along a single track that wound its way deep into the undergrowth, yet they were spaced out far enough apart that you couldn't see the next cabin along at all. It was so remote that there wasn't even a mobile phone signal there, and the only other dwelling was the owner's house, which was much back at the main entrance from the access road. The cabins were at ground level at the front, where there was also a space to park, and at the back was wooden decking with a table and chairs and a barbecue. As the land sloped, the deck at the back was about three to four feet off the ground, and the vegetation came right up to the back and sides of the buildings. We've included a few photos so you can get a feel for the location and area. Later in the year, we decided to get married, inviting just our grown-up children, their partners, and a few close friends. We thought it would be a great idea to hire all four cabins for the weekend and to actually get married right there in the rainforest. So that's what we did. Our biggest worry was the many venomous snakes the owners had warned us about, but it turned out it was the leeches which gave us the most grief. Everyone had one on them at some point, which gives you an indication of how dense the vegetation was. Everyone came and stayed a couple of nights, and we were married on the back decking. With the weekend over, everyone eventually left except for Claire's best friend Carrie and her partner Joe, who stayed on an extra night with us. After our first trip there, we discovered it was actually a hot spot for Yowie, and in fact, to our surprise, it was actually the number one hot spot in Australia. There were so many stories of Yowie encounters in the area. Many people who lived in the local town of Springbrook or had visited seemed to have Yowie stories with warnings to visitors to be wary of going into the dense undergrowth, especially at night. Builders working on houses there had heard loud, blood-curdling roars emanating from the surrounding bushland and had hurriedly finished their work so they didn't have to go back into that area again. It was just the four of us left there now, and Joe and Carrie came around to our cabin for a barbecue and drinks. Joe is Aboriginal and a very intelligent guy. He worked as a lecturer in Aboriginal studies for a university and had traveled the world extensively to places like Machu Picchu, and had even been inside the Giza pyramids. He was also an elder for his tribe and deeply involved with the Aboriginal culture, so I thought he would be a great person to ask about Yowies. I tentatively asked him if he thought Yowies really existed, and he just calmly said, yes, they do, without any doubt. He told me how his granddad had seen them many times, and how when he was young he used to tell him stories about the hairy men. He told me how he had seen them himself when he was young, so he knew they really existed. He said that all Aborigines know they're real, and it's just Western culture who find it hard to believe. He explained that they live in the higher parts of the mountains, or it's inhospitable, and they're left alone. He told me it was ironic how many Aboriginals were accusing the white people of stealing their lands from them, because originally it hadn't been their land at all. He said it's written in their folklore of how when the aboriginals first arrived in Australia tens of thousands of years ago, 
it was already occupied by the hairy men. The Aborigines had fought with them, and because the Aborigines were smarter, the hairy men eventually were forced to retreat to the hills, leaving the nice coastal areas to the new arrivals. I asked how the Aborigines can claim they had their land taken from them by the white man. They themselves had originally taken it off the hairy men. He just laughed and said, they know very well, but we're just taking advantage of white people not having the courage to believe something like the Yowie could actually be real. We talked about it for a while, and he mentioned that where we were staying is just the sort of area they live in. Gary said, tell them about last night. And he told us how, late the night before, he had sensed there was something outside their cabin in the undergrowth. He had that indigenous sixth sense so many of us don't pay attention to, and was in tune with the land. He had stood in their cabin, silently in the dark for ages, watching out the window, knowing there was something out there watching back. At one point, he had actually seen something bipedal moving through the undergrowth, and also saw the silhouette of it in a small clearing. He said there was definitely a Yowie around there. Joe and Carrie left the next day, and we had a couple more days there on our own. On our final night, we thought we might as well have the barbecue one last time for dinner. It was dark and lightly raining outside, so we decided to cook out there, but eat inside. I turned the lights on and went out onto the decking at the back and fired the barbecue up to cook on. I had that distinct feeling of being watched. Claire and I are very sensitive and had many unusual experiences, so we listen to those senses, and they are usually right. I have a degree in science, and so I'm also very analytical. It's my profession, and I don't easily jump to wild conclusions. The rainforest had been alive with sounds all weekend, but I noticed it was now eerily silent. When the barbecue had heated up, I went back out to put the food on it. As I was placing the sausages on the grill, I heard a big crack as a twig snapped not far away. It wasn't a lightweight twig. It was a distinct piercing snap from a reasonably thick twig. I stood there motionless and silent for a while, peering into the darkness and listening. I couldn't hear anything moving at all, as you would expect if it was an animal there. I reasoned to make a crack like that would require a reasonable amount of weight so I was surprised I didn't hear whatever it was moving around or the rustling of leaves that, say, maybe a python might make slithering around in the scrub. A few minutes later, there was another distinct crack a few yards further over. Again, I looked and listened into the undergrowth, but it was silent. I went inside. I later came back out to check how things were cooking. The smell of meat cooking was now wafting into the surrounding undergrowth, and again... I felt like something was watching me, this time even stronger than before. Other than the lightly falling rain, it was silent. Then, crack, crack, followed by maybe two or three more cracks close together, each slowly getting closer and then silence again. There was something moving around. I didn't feel good being out there anymore. I went back in and told Claire I was hearing strange noises outside and thought there was something out there but also that it was probably just me, as I didn't want to scare, so understandably she didn't really pay much attention to it. I went back out for the final time. Straight away, I heard something moving in the bushes. This time it was really close, not more than 20 to 25 yards away. I froze and stared intently and listened. I could actually hear it stepping through the undergrowth. I could hear each individual step, the sound of one leg slowly pushing through the undergrowth, and then the crack of a twig, followed by the same again with the other, and then a pause. I hadn't been drinking, and I know I wasn't imagining it. It was definitely bipedal. It wasn't any sort of four-legged animal or a python. It had to be either a human or a yaoi. Either way, creeping around in the dark undergrowth on private property at night in the middle of nowhere and stalking our cabin wasn't good. More twigs were cracking, and I could hear the rustle of it pushing through the vegetation. I was terrified. I was ready, expecting it to appear at any second. The deck was only three or four feet off the ground, and by the time I would be able to see it, it could be stepping over the railing onto the deck. It was now taking four to five steps, then stopping completely for about a minute. Then it would start moving again. Each time, it seemed to be slowly inching its way closer. I grabbed the food from the barbecue as quickly as I could. 
it started moving again and seemed to have stopped caring if it was being heard now and was taking about six to eight quick steps at a time. I turned around, peering into the darkness trying to see it, but couldn't. I knew exactly where it was, I just couldn't see it because it was pitch black and the vegetation was too thick to see through. It was moving more across now rather than towards me. I could hear it moving to the right as if it was circling around our cabin and didn't want to come any closer. I turned the barbecue off and went inside and quickly locked the door, pretending it would make me feel safer. As I turned around to tell Claire what had happened, the sensor light suddenly went off out on the front of the cabin and lit up the entire front area where the car was parked. Claire jumped up and said there was someone out there and that they had set the sensor off. Remember, I hadn't told her yet what I had just heard out the back. We couldn't see what it was, and we weren't game to go out and look. We turned the inside lights off and peered out. As I started to tell her what had happened out the back, the sensor light tripped and clicked back on a number of times. So it was still around out the front, setting off the sensor, but just keeping out of the light. Eventually, it stayed off, and we finally sat down to eat uneasily. I told Claire about what I'd heard the final time I'd gone out the back, and the earlier times, and how there was definitely something on two feet moving through the undergrowth. We spent a nervy night, wondering if whatever it was was still around or would return. Our bed was right by the main sliding door, which had floor-to-ceiling glass, and the bathroom had a floor-to-ceiling glass wall looking right into the undergrowth, with no blind or curtain to shut any stalking eyes out. Every time we looked up from the bed or went to the toilet, we half expected to see something standing outside looking in. A couple of nights earlier, Claire had said she thought she'd seen two red eyes outside the bathroom in the middle of the night, but we dismissed it at the time. The owners told us that the other three cabins were unoccupied that night, so we knew we were there on our own. It gave us both the creeps, just thinking that there was something lurking around outside, in the undergrowth, in the dark. The next morning, in the daylight, we went around to the back of the cabin and down to roughly where the noises had been coming from to see if we could see anything. One strange thing we found were branches, which had clearly been snapped off trees, laid out in uniform patterns on the ground in a way that could not happen naturally. We knew about Yowies and that Springbrook is the number one hotspot for them, but we never imagined that we might encounter one there too. Yet we both came to accept that we must have. We know that feeling now, and whenever we hear of others having strange encounters, or that feeling of being stalked, those cold prickly goosebumps come crawling back all over our bodies again, just like an old friend telling us to trust their gut feeling, and run. Signed, Mark and Claire my encounter with a dark being. My encounter with what I suppose that people are referring to as a shadow man was when I was about 21 years old, although to me it just seemed like a huge dark mass without the defining features of legs or arms, although it did stand upright. Now as I think about it, it seemed almost as if it was robed with a hood on its head. At that time I'd moved back in with my parents after a time of living out of town working with some buddies. I turned a utility building on my parents' property into my bedroom, and a friend of the family had come by for a visit while I was going to work one day. She decided she would go out and cleanse my bedroom of any negative or evil spirits. When I got home, my mom told me what her friend had done. Well, I was grateful because back then speaking of cleansing a home was common knowledge. But up to this time, though, I had not had any negative vibes inside my bedroom, but if our friend wanted to make sure that my room was clear of evil, that was fine with me. Well, that night, after I turned in for bed, lights out, and the only light coming into my room was through the windows, I looked up to suddenly see a dark figure standing by my bed. It was standing only about six inches away from my bedside. It was about six feet tall, with a pointed shaped head, possibly as if it were wearing a hood over its head, and it was darker than the darkness in my room. Wasting no time and drawing heavily upon my religious teachings and beliefs, I began rebuking this ghastly being in the name of Jesus, while simultaneously turning the bedside lamp on, and immediately it vanished from my room. Instead of cleansing my room of evil spirits, to my shock and surprise, undoubtedly my friend had actually dropped off an evil spirit into my room. This didn't surprise me, 
because it was allegedly believed by some folks that our friend practiced witchcraft from time to time, although she was a professing Christian. I can't say that our friend meant any wrongdoing when she decided to clean my room that day, and I'd always considered her as a person to look to for spiritual guidance. But I wonder if the line between esotericism and Christianity became a blur for her at times, or maybe she just moved from one to the other when she desired to do so. I guess a good moral of the story is, be sure and know the person who is cleansing your house of evil spirits. They have to really have power with the Most High God in order to cleanse your house. Well, I hope you enjoyed this story. Thank you for sharing. Clifton California Glimmer Man Encounter Hi, I want to share my own story and hope to bring more awareness to the topic. English is my second language, so please excuse me if my storytelling isn't good. I was an international student in 2007 when this encounter happened. At that time, I used to live alone in a small two-story townhouse in Arcadia, a small town located within Los Angeles in Southern California. College life was stressful for me. I skipped many classes and missed many class assignment deadlines, and that caused me to have depression. One evening, after watching TV all day inside my bedroom and doing nothing productive, I wanted to go to the kitchen downstairs to cook dinner. I turned off the TV, got up and walked to the door. But when I opened the bedroom door, I saw a translucent humanoid thing. It was sitting on the floor in the common area with legs crossed and its back faced my direction. I was so shocked and terrified when I saw it. I clearly saw its outlines. It was cloaked like the alien in the Predator movie. It was about five to six feet tall and a thin body. I felt a strong malevolent energy coming from it. I closed back my bedroom door and locked it from the inside when it started to get up slowly and walk toward me. I tried to stay awake that night, with the possibility that it could go through solid doors and walls cross my mind. I turned on an audio Bible with maximum volume and prayed to God to send His divine protection. I didn't come out until the following day around noon because I thought sunlight from the windows would make that thing go away. The day after, it was gone, and I didn't ever see it again. Thank you for your time. Signed, Albert. Lake Giacomo Glimmerman. Good day. My name is Christina. I have an experience with a translucent entity that I would like to share with you. My main concern is seeking answers to what exactly I've witnessed while at Lake Giacomo on two separate occasions, the second one being dark energies or black slash gray orbs, possibly the fey or forest spirits. The first incident was right around four years ago. I know this because the other day I found the citation I'd received on my car for being at the lake past closing time, which is sunset. Finding it brought the feelings I'd experienced that night and for several months, even years afterwards, back to me. These feelings consist of a deep need to know, almost to the point of obsession, what I saw and what other people have seen as well. I need answers. So let me explain. Myself and my boyfriend were at Lake Giacomo sometime in April 2017. I could tell you the exact date if I had the citation in front of me, but it's put away. Anyway, he and I love to be out in nature, digging up plants to plant in the yard, or picking flowers, or just being outdoors. We also collect things like rocks, interesting ones with crystals, also driftwood, and my favorite, arrowheads. Things like that. We also collect old bottles, and you can find most of these things there. So it was probably around 6 p.m. on that spring night when we arrive at the lake. The sun doesn't set until about 7.30 or 8. That's when they lock the gates. And it's posted. Thinking about it, it's funny because they only lock down part of the lake. The rest of the lake you can go to all night long, anytime. Anyway, so we mess around, find a snake, and video it. Then I go my own way looking for something cool to add to our collection. My boyfriend stays up on a rock cliff face and I venture down into the area below where he is and go around the corner. We're probably 50 feet apart, but I can't see him and he can't see me. He told me that he heard a splash in the water just a good 10 minutes after I went down to where I was, which I wasn't near the water, and he thought maybe it was me messing with him, but I know it wasn't. And he thought he felt a presence of something and maybe saw movements out of a peripheral vision, which he also then again thought it was me, 
and he looked and didn't see anything, so then his mind started wandering, thinking that I was somehow doing some sort of magic or something and messing with his head, which isn't something that I would do, because I'm not a practitioner of witchcraft at all. So he says he hollers for me, calls my name several times, and I didn't hear him not one time. I didn't hear anything, and so eventually he comes down and finds me. At this point, it's after dark, so we walked over toward my car to leave. Before we go, though, he decides to go down to the water to do whatever it is he wanted to do. That's when I found a citation on my car for being there after curfew, which I just found again the other day, and it reminded me of this whole thing all over again. My car was parked roughly 45 feet down off the road. The road is on a curve with a guardrail. It's also parked about 35 feet from the water where he is. I'm standing by my car when I hear what I assume is someone walking up with the road. It definitely sounded bipedal, footsteps crunching leaves. I mean, clearly, I can hear the leaves and the little twigs breaking, so it's obvious to me that somebody was up there and wanted me to know it. They weren't trying to be stealthy. But when I look up there at first, I didn't see anything. As I'm watching and listening and hearing, I begin to make out a shimmery, see-through moving thing. To me, it looked like water moving. Like on the movie The Abyss, when that water thing comes out of the water and is moving like that in a different shape. Not any tubular water funnel. It was like a body or a mass of water walking. And when I say walking, I mean I could see its movements, and it was seemingly moving forward in a walking fashion, and it was crunching the leaves as it did, so telling me that it had mass and some weight behind it, even though it was practically invisible. By practically invisible, I mean I could see it, but it was definitely clear and see-through. If it wasn't moving, I might not have seen it at all. In what seemed to me to feel like almost a state of shock, like my mind was denying what I'm looking at, trying to make sense of it, there was nothing I could compare it to that I've ever witnessed before, besides in the movies. I could see through it, and I had to really focus. And I'm like, am I really seeing this? Is something walking up there? I could see it moving, like you can just tell when something's moving. And there's just enough light behind it coming from the street light that I could see it shimmer as it moved. And I'm sure no more than a minute or two goes by, and my mind still isn't sure what I'm looking at and is still in denial. It seemed to be about 10 to 12 feet tall, I swear, but I'm not the best judge of those things. So I kept looking, trying to figure out what it is I'm looking at, and I'm hearing it, and it's definitely walking. I can totally hear it and see something, and I'm about 45 to 50 feet down from where it is. It wasn't trying to be quiet, so it wanted me to know it was there. So my boyfriend comes up towards me and I say, Hey babe, I think there's somebody up there. Why don't you check it out? My boyfriend is bold and pretty much fearless, and I know he can handle himself. And at that time, I didn't feel there was any danger or I would have sent him up there. So he walks up there. I didn't tell him what I was thinking or what I saw either, because I wasn't sure at that point, and I didn't want him to think I was crazy, and I also needed some personal confirmation that I'm not crazy. So he goes up there and checks it out, comes back down, and I ask, was there somebody up there? He's like, there was something up there. And my stomach just drops, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm really not crazy, and you saw it too. And he's like, yeah, I did. I said, what was it? He said, I don't know exactly. And it just stepped over the guardrail and was gone. At that point, I'm like, okay, let's go. We get in the car and we leave. That's when I start getting really freaked out for some reason. I don't know why, but I became overwhelmingly scared right then, as I didn't know what it was, and he confirmed what I thought I saw. I really saw it, and I felt like there was no denying it. I really did see it, and it scared me. There was something invisible walking and watching us, and clearly it wanted us to know that it was there. So we get around to the gate that they locked because it was after dark, and we're supposed to be out of there. So he walks like a football field away from me trying to find somebody to open the gate. And I'm freaking out the whole time because he left me in the car by myself and I'm thinking it's going to come back and get me. He eventually comes back to the car and we end up driving around the big stones they placed around the gate to keep people in or out so people can't drive around it. But we found a way and I was terrified the whole time mainly because I didn't know what it was and I never saw anything like that before or heard of anything like that. 
But we got out of there, and I was obsessed for the longest time with figuring out what it was. I googled it, everything I could think of, and I came across the Reddit story and your other stories about some witness encounters with invisible beings in the woods, but no definitive answers. These were just stories people told, just like me, but nobody seems to know what it is. And I'm sure people thought I was nuts for a while because I was talking about it because I wanted to know what it was. I wanted to know what it was, why it was there, where it came from, and why it chose us. Lee's Summit is not a small town. A lot of people bike and hike out there along with fishing and camping. So I was hoping that somebody else had seen it as well. How am I going to find out unless I talk about it, share my story, and ask questions? But as you would expect, everybody just kind of looked at me like I was crazy. My boyfriend wouldn't talk about it with anyone, barely would even talk about it with me. And there I was obsessed over it. Eventually, you know, I just got tired of looking without finding any answer. So I kind of put it out of my mind after I spent hours researching, telling people my story, asking people with no real progress being made, and no real answers in solving my riddle. I even went back and visited the lake by myself, trying to see if I could see it again. I went in the daytime, though. I'm not that brave. I mean, I really wanted an answer. My desire to find answers was stronger than my fear of this entity. Who knows? If I'd ran into it again by myself, I might change my mind about which one was stronger. When I found my citation the other day, it came back into my mind and has become a strong guiding focal point again in my life. Seems like it's not quite as taboo to talk about such things as it was even four years ago, and I want to find answers still. I'm hoping that you or somebody will talk about it on the show or other shows and amongst the people that you communicate with or just anyone in general you come across and get the ball rolling on finding more evidence on what it is, who else has had sightings, so on. I know more and more sightings of these invisible creatures have happened, and I believe we need to know and should be making it a priority to find out what they are exactly. I feel something that can cloak itself with invisibility is a big deal, and we should educate ourselves on what we're dealing with, and you would think the government would be all over that. I won't settle for assumptions. We need to know what they are, no guessing. I've heard Bigfoot and aliens, but I want to know for sure. I want to know 100%, no question. Okay, so that was the first experience at Lake Giacomo. The other one was just a couple months ago when I went to the lake all by myself, because I'm a big girl. But kidding, making jokes. But I was alone. And on this day, there was nobody out there. I could have screamed and there would have been nobody near enough to hear me. The overall energy was a little unnerving. I typically always walk down a certain trail and I go down by the water and I look for driftwood and then I go back to the trail and keep walking around, checking on my little spots for gorgeous driftwood I can't live without. That day, it just felt different. I felt uneasy and I thought I heard somebody holler something while I was down by the water, but I didn't see anybody. And I know for a fact there were no cars parked at the trailhead when I came down just moments before. I can remember feeling like I needed to constantly be aware of my surroundings, and generally I'm stuck in the dirt looking for arrowheads or looking for driftwood, and I'm not paying attention to my surroundings. But that day, something told me that I needed to. Of course, there was also the fact that I kept seeing what I thought was a bird flying from one tree to another out of my peripheral vision when I looked up there. But there would be nothing there, and it happened several times. Once again, I told myself, you're leaving, but I didn't leave. Instead, I got my phone out and I started recording. And I went on for about, I don't know, 20 minutes, turned around and went back ignoring my gut feelings, but I made it out of there, and when I got home, I went over my video footage. And lo and behold, I caught a black orb, but I know I saw it following me around. I caught it no less than 14 times on three different videos. This, plus a couple other different anomalies, and I would like to know what they are and what it meant. I did look up orbs and their colors and meanings. Black orbs usually get a bad reputation because they usually accompany something bad happening to somebody. But the role of these entities, as far as I understood it to be, is to make you uncomfortable so you leave a certain situation because there's something in the area or in front of you that's going to harm you. So, really, in my eyes, they're a blessing. It's like they're watching out for you, even if they make you feel uncomfortable. It's for a good reason. With the same token, I didn't leave when I felt like I should have that day. 
Instead, I kept going and recording, and nothing bad happened to me. So maybe they weren't even black orbs after all. Maybe they were some other type entity. I don't know, but I sure would like some answers. Thanks. Signed, Christina. My Strange Encounters My story is similar to some I've heard on your channel. However, it happened to me before I ever knew there were other stories out there. It started as I began studying ancient folk religions for a class in university. At least, I believe this type of thinking is what conditioned my mind to be sensitive and perceptive to the experience. Come near the end of the semester, I was tripping acid before final exams. The trip I had was beyond belief. I was sitting on the couch when all of a sudden, or slowly, I could not tell the time, there was a haunting gale that became audible, like a tornado had surrounded my apartment. Then, from out of an electrical socket, came multiple, around ten, small creatures that I at the time called electric elves. They were several inches tall and a dark color. They were laughing and giggling as they crawled all over my body. However, I felt no sensation, only visual and audible registers of the phenomenon. Now, I've tripped many times before, and this encounter was completely unlike anything I'd ever experienced because of how tangible and real it was. My girlfriend was with me and her usually timid dog. The dog was laying under the bed for most of the day, but as soon as this experience came on, the dog came right out from the bedroom and crawled onto my lap. The dog was completely relaxed, so I was too. I eventually got up and moved from the couch after my girlfriend began a conversation, thus ending the experience. But this was only the beginning. The days to come would yield much more vivid sensations of the otherworldly, and I was much more sober too, debunking the idea that it was purely an induced hallucination due to the drug. I could not stay at my normal place because of vivid apparitions that would come to me after a long study session even weeks before my intake of any hallucinogen. I saw many things manifest in the dark void of my closet late at night, some that could only be explained as religious. I saw a four-winged owl and what appeared to be three shadow figures and a much smaller hooded figure beside them. Even when I closed my eyes, I could not stop seeing these things. I noticed that my ability to understand my studies had greatly increased and I was designing complete chemical processes out of my head and making inferences to the most complex quantum mechanical principles and atomic properties that were not taught to me at the level of school I was at. This is something even professional chemists have trouble doing. I feel like this increased level of insight was due to the thinning of the veil that was already occurring around me, like accessing another dimensional fount of knowledge and power. I had to get out of this house. But the end of the semester was here, so to take my final exams, I rented a hotel room for a week and went to work. During and after my last test, I kept feeling the uncontrollable urge to get on a plane, without a set destination. But I eventually settled on Phoenix, Arizona, due to my girlfriend having family in the area. I would make it to the city, but the first night proved to be too much for me. I resisted several uncontrollable urges to get on the plane, but eventually succumbed to the external pressure beckoning me onward and dropped everything and took the flight. Even on the plane, I felt the sensation that I was leaving this world in one way or another. I did not arrange for a hotel, choosing instead to spend the first night under the stars. To get a better look at them, I climbed atop a two-story building and laid out on the roof. From this roof, I saw an extremely large triangular craft with lights running evenly spaced along its trim in the air. I stayed here for some time and was then shown two balls of light far in the distance of the night sky. They were plummeting directly into the earth, one after the other. However, there were no tails like shooting stars, though they did give off a reddish light. Their trajectory did not match any meteor as they moved at a 90 degree angle with the ground, meeting it at a point in the distance. There was no sound of impact or flash of light. I knew immediately this was it what I'd been brought out here to see. In order to get a better look at both phenomenons, I tried to climb down to the ground. It seemed to be as easy as when I climbed up, but when I committed to the climb, I felt a shift of gravity and was pulled backwards off the ledge by some external force. I hit the ground, breaking my wrist and elbow, 
as well as shattering of vertebrae in my back. In the hospital, I saw a reflection in the metal light above my hospital bed of my own funeral, with all my family. However, my casket was open and the service was being held in the house where I'd initially started having the visuals in the closet instead of a church. I looked away several times for long periods, hoping it would go away, but every time I looked up at the light, it was still there. Also, one of my nurses seemed to know what was happening to me and wrote a strange rune on the glass window to the bathroom of the hospital room. It looked like something occult and was no way a medical or scientific symbol, as I'm a trained chemist and electrician, a man of science. The following day, I was moved out of this room that was in a tower into a separate tower. After my transfer, I attempted to locate the first tower I was in, but it seemed to not exist as there were no signs in the hospital for it. I was crippled for a long time, but after my surgery I had rods inserted into my back that completely returned my mobility with basically no pain. It was a literal miracle that I had bone fragments lodged in my spinal cord that should have at least partially paralyzed me. The weirdness of visions did not stop there. I returned to my hometown after being released from the hospital in Phoenix and immediately moved out of the old haunted house I was staying in before. My parents were skeptical, but helped me as they could tell I was experiencing something strange, having told them of the off feelings I was having even before my trip to Arizona. I moved into a hotel while I was waiting for the paperwork to process for a new lease. At this hotel, I had several visions, mainly of a floating head of an old man telling me something I couldn't make out, possibly insulting me. I was awake for this, not dreaming, as I got up from the bed after the vision disappeared to make sure. Then, after moving into my new apartment, it seems that not only did whatever was at the first house follow me, but it had been amplified by my experience in Phoenix. The first strange thing happened about a week into my new lease. I was in bed and fell asleep like usual. It is where I woke up that truly startled me. I came to on my balcony of the third floor and was thrust into a literal fight for my life with a force I could not see, but it was very strong and was trying to force me over the railing to fall to the ground below probably trying to finish the job from earlier when I'd survived. I was screaming and panting in a cold sweat, but managed to wrestle myself back inside and close the door, bolting it shut. I immediately broke down at the sheer gravity of the situation and had to call my girlfriend to let her know. She knew weird things were happening and did not know what to make of it, but she was worried and was inclined to agree with me. I had been completely normal before these things started happening. The next phenomenon that happened to me occurred late at night again, as they did at the first residence, though were many, many figures that looked like alien or extra-dimensional. They were phantasmal, as if made of energy or matters that we are not. One of them appeared to be in charge, and he would look directly at me while standing over my bed. I never felt fear and actually smiled at them because I could tell they were harmless, or if they did want to hurt me, they would just do it. They were trying to show me something whatever that was. My room would be full of several of these creatures, all of different appearances, all metaphysical in nature. It seems they came through my window like the moonlight itself. Eventually the visions lessened, and as I healed, perhaps they were involved in my injury and recovery, perhaps as a study of our medical capabilities, or just because in their infinite transcendental existence, they were bored and see us as playthings. Whatever happened to me cannot be written off as a mere psychedelic experience, as I was not under the influence of hallucinogens for 90% of the encounters. I feel that whatever it is can completely control and manipulate our brain waves and possibly enter our bodies as a possession. May it be demons, aliens, ghosts, spirits of nature, I do not know, nor am I going to stress the specifics. I just know what I saw and felt, and it was too real. I felt a new sense of agency after this experience, like I had been chosen to bear some higher knowledge than most of my fellow men, and had to pay a flesh price for it with my vertebra bone that was extracted from my body. I do not want this power to connect with the other side, nor do I want it. I simply am it. Signed, Gray. What a great collection of weird encounters. Thanks again for listening, and let us know what you think about these personal stories in the comments below. But again, please be respectful of the opinions of others. If you have any strange stories yourself you would like to see featured in an upcoming video, 
by all means, you can send them to disappearanceof at gmail.com or nationalparkmysteriesyt at gmail.com or to me personally at stevestockton81 at gmail.com. We love sharing your encounters with humanoids, cryptids, or any other type of weird entity or experience that is beyond explanation. Please be sure to leave us a like on the video and to share and subscribe for more strange stories. Meanwhile, be good to yourselves and each other. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time.